feel free to interrupt me at any point uh, with any questions. OK, so uh, all of you have um, at least manager level uh, permissions on ChurchX, and therefore uh, you will see these links here for managers on the right hand side. And um, I may kind of tidy this up a little bit, but this is what it looks like at the moment. And um, it's kind of the fastest way, but you could also just click on the catalog thing itself. So if I if I just click on the image of Sophia here, um, this is the um, what it looks like at the top level of the catalog. And you see we just have these catalog cards. I am not 100% committed to this design of graphics for representing the uh, the things. And I know that the um, United Learning Shop um, is going to be looking at that and trying to come up with something a little more creative. But uh, until then, this is kind of a filler. So if we look at like edges, for example, if I click on edges course, you can see that there's a, a catalog. You can see that you've got some links on the top here. Again, these only appear for managers, the view catalogs, manage catalogs, edit catalogs, et cetera. Um, this image right here, um, uh, I'll show you where that is in the settings in a minute. Um, the way that that's done is it's the total length of the available screen, and then whatever proportionally is the height uh, of the image after that width is accommodated. So if you want a fairly narrow barrow, banner, just make it fairly narrow, right? And and it'll just fit to, to accommodate it. Um, and that's customizable. Um, this part right here, which which uh, has says as edge ministries, and then this kind of subtitle, this is, uh, I call this the title block. and it is configurable as well, both the font color and the color of the space behind it. So if you wanted to, if you had like an image that was say had a red background and you set the same color to your block, they would actually look like they were the same visual element if you wanted to do that. Um, so, OK, so we'll, we'll get into where that settings are and stuff like that. And then you get this description and this description is basically HTML and I'll show you where that is in a minute. And um, so because it's HTML, you can use other things besides text. So if you wanted to format the text with headings and, and you know lists and things like that, you could. If you wanted to embed a video, you could. Uh, if you want to do um, you know any of that stuff, you can. The only sort of thing to be aware of when you're making HTML for this or for the product cards is that you have to use inline CSS styling. So what that means is that if you know, a lot of times in HTML, you sort of make reference at the beginning of a page to what's called a style sheet that exists somewhere else on the website. And that's where it gets its styling information for, you know, what color things are, what fonts are being used and so forth. But that doesn't really work here because, you know, what formatting the edge might want to use might be different from the formatting that Junius wants to use and so forth. So because of that, you have to do the styling much kind of closer to the text. So that means actually using what's called inline styling. Um, pro tip. I find that chat GPT actually writes pretty decent uh, code. So if you want to do a quick and dirty job, you can just like take something and then ask chat GPT, okay, format this in HTML with inline CSS styling, and it'll usually get it on the first on the right try. First time, right try. First try, right, anyway, you get it. Okay, so, um, okay, so these are some catalogs, and you see here I have some examples um, that, uh, that Sarah has created of sub catalogs, right? Um, edge the signpost series, uh, edge community events, and so forth. And I'll show you how to nest those catalogs in a second, but this is the basic sort of what these appear like. And then you see also there's one or two courses that actually appear uh, in this catalog already. So a catalog can contain products. It can also contain other catalogs. And you can do it recursively in any kind of way you want. So you could have like a master catalog for edge, for example, and then you could have a sub catalog for events. And you could have the master catalog listed in that sub catalog as well. So they go back and forth. So you have a lot of flexibility for how you want to organize your catalogs. It's not a strict hierarchy. You can, it's more associative than that. You can make it work like a hierarchy if you want, but you don't have to. Okay, so um, now I'm going to get into like a, how to edit a catalog. Uh, so if I hit edit catalog, ta -da, uh, this, is, this is what it looks like. The add a new catalog, um, Page looks pretty much identical to this, so, so it'll make sense. OK, so you need to give it a name and a unique ID. Um, this unique ID um, basically never gets seen by by uh, students, so you don't need to worry too much about it. But it's just something that internally will be kind of a short code that we can use. Um, you designate the partner uh, here in this drop down list. Um, most of you, because you're only managing one category, will only have like one option anyway. But uh, but if you do have multiple you know things you're in charge of then you can do that uh, listed in catalog this is really important this is where you determine what catalog this appears in okay so you can see there's two checked marked here so this catalog itself appears in the churchx main catalog as well as the united learning catalog 
but if you want it to appear in another catalog, you could just click it here and it would it would appear. OK, so uh, the next thing here is include in search, right? This is important uh, and that's too bad. It wasn't clicked. I'll just click it there. Um, so um, because we have the capability of having secret courses and secret catalogs, that means we need a way to indicate whether or not they appear when people search for them or not. So this is where that option is. So if this is unclicked, then when people search for your stuff, they're not going to find it. So it needs to be clicked for that. OK, uh, thumbnails. Um, this is the image that appears as the kind of avatar for the catalog. Remember before we, we said this is where that appears. Um, I do have an Illustrator template for for that as well as I have a um, um, one for um, uh, what is that uh, online image creation tool that everybody Canva. Um, I have one for Canva as well. So if you need that later, just just ask me for it and I can I can send it to you. Um, this image never gets cropped, so you're safe going all the way to the edges. But we do have this kind of standard format we like to use with all our thumbnails of the icon for your for yourself, for your partner uh, appearing in the lower right hand corner with a circle and then the the um, the rest of it is kind of a rectangle. Uh, and that way we have kind of consistency. OK, banner, I was talking about this before. It goes to the full width and then it doesn't crop. It just does whatever height you are. So you can you can set that appropriately. Short description, um, kind of self-explanatory, long description. And as I said, if you toggle this over to HTML mode, then you unlock all the capabilities of HTML with doing, uh, you know, embedding video or anything else. If you wanted to get really fancy, you could actually embed JavaScript if you wanted to do something with that. But you know, if, if you need to do that, need help with that, let me know and I, I can help troubleshoot that. But anyway, so that's that's good so far. Um, the meta title, meta description, meta keywords, these are all things that are helpful for when you go to uh, share your catalog on social media or on um, or uh, when it's being searched for on like Google and things like that. So there is a check mark here that you can use to just use the existing catalog title you already created. But if you wanted to like tweak it a little bit so that it shows up a little more clearly in search, you can you can do something different here. Uh, same thing with meta description. You can use the existing short description or you can come up with something else a little bit different if you want. Um, and then the same thing with the keywords. Uh, you just have to give some keywords. OK, that's a fire hose, but it's I think most of you know how to use all this stuff. Is that all pretty clear? Any? OK, great. OK, next we have uh, the dates of visibility and and availability. The difference there is something can be visible in the catalog, but not purchasable. OK, and so an example of that might be if you were creating some new program and you weren't 100 percent sure you're actually going to run it or not unless you knew you had enough people. So you didn't want people actually paying for it yet until you knew for sure you could do that where you had a visibility start date and then like a couple of weeks before the actual start and what would happen in that case is there would be a um, so this is with products uh, then there'd be a wait list in catalogs um, I'm not actually sure the availability date does anything now I think about it um, I'll have to talk to the developers about that I don't think we need that uh, anyway so this is because it's catalogs but in products if you have a product it can be visible but not purchasable if that makes sense uh, OK, so and it's enable or not enable the dates. This is where you set the text and background color. Um, and you have if you just want to eyeball it, you can use this little color picker and just kind of click on it if you want to eyeball colors. Um, but if you want to um, um, put in a color code, a hex code, you can do that. Um, the only thing to check for is to make sure that your background color and your text color are compliant with WCAG um, accessibility rules. And if you're not sure what those are, you can just Google like uh, color picker for you know WCAG, which is the compliance standard, and you'll get a little color picker tool. Uh, Junius, so if you had a product visible but not available, could people? Sorry, Junius, can you just say what that question was? And I'll. Yeah, so basically, could you say, let's say I had a course, and I'm not sure that I, when I'm going to run it, but I can throw it up there, and people could join the waiting list, and then I can look and say, you know what, ten people are interested in taking this course. Maybe it's time to go ahead and offer it. Yes. You can do that. Nice. Yeah. And um, as is the wait list is like 90% there, it'll be in the next release. Uh, but like right now, the, the waiting list works and it would take names. But as a manager, you, and even as an admin, I can't actually generate that list. I can't look at that list just yet. That's the next functionality they have to add. But the way it'll work is um, I'll show you when we get to products how the wait list functionality will work. But yes, it's there. OK, so that's I think catalogs. Does anyone have any questions about how catalogs work? Okay, great. Yeah, they're 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 pretty easy. 
All right. So uh, if I go back to like catalogs and like I'll, I'll pick a pick on a random United Learning course here. Um, how about this getting started in stewardship one? Actually, there's even a better stewardship one. Um, this one's even better because it's got an embedded video and everything. OK, so. Um, um, so this is a product. Um, the sections here are this this section at the top here, which I call the title block is composed of um, there's a listing here of like what catalog it appears in, at least the main catalog it appears in. Then there's the title, a subtitle, okay? Any hashtags uh, that have been associated with it, the language, if it's been designated, if it's a team-based course, it gets a little tag here. Um, the price, of course, appears over here. Uh, Junius, if you're wondering, the site is completely compatible with, with US currency, and this would just be USD instead of CAD. And when it charges people, it charges them in whatever currency um, you have set as at the product level. So anyway, I'll, I'll, yeah, so it, it will make no difference whether you're European, Canadian, whatever. Um, and and the, the currency conversion will happen at the level of your credit card processor, not at the level of the site, which is great. It makes it a lot easier. Um, now, you notice this is access right now. That's because this button is smart enough that it knows that I'm already enrolled in this course. So I'm getting a, an access now button instead of a, a buy now button. And so we don't have that problem of people being confused anymore about the difference between the catalog and accessing their courses directly. It'll just take them straight in either way. Um, if it's a free course, what would appear here is join now in parentheses free. Okay. Um, so again, they can just go right in. Um, this little thing here, um, which is the kind of uh, summary um, uh, that appears in this block, I'll show you where that appears in a second. Um, but it's just a nice little kind of graphical thing to kind of give people a summary of the contents of the course. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, now I'm going to kind of show you how it actually works. Um, so if I go to edit this product, now you get the full listing. OK, so um, of course there's an, and you give it a name. Um, you got to give it you, you optionally a subtitle. Um, I know that United Learning has been using that to put the dates of programs that they run quite a bit, which makes a lot of sense. Um, a product number. In most cases, you can just use the course number, um, but it does need to be unique. So if you're going to use like multiple listings to refer to the same thing, you might just put a little something after it. Where that's going to become important is when you're running sales reports and things like that, and you want to know like filter for different enrollments and different products. That's, that's why it's helpful. Um, OK, listed in catalogs. Like with the catalog function, you, this is where you indicate what catalogs it appears in, and you can pick as many as you want. Okay. Um, again, a show and search, or if that's unclicked, it's hidden. Okay. Uh, the image kind of thing we went over, it works the same as in catalogs. You just update, you upload one image. Uh, pro tip, if you ever have lost an image and you want to be able to, to work with a previous image, if you just click on this, you can download or delete it. So you could just download the file that you used before and then use it for something else or whatever. Um, kind of nice. Uh, image for social media. This is a new change that just got launched today. Um, this way, what I noticed was when I was sharing products onto Twitter and Facebook, it was always cropping the image, uh, the the, uh, the the product image, because they just do that on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and so on. So what I did here was I created another way that you can upload an image that's specially made for social media sharing. Um, so you just put that in, in here. OK, um, again, you designate the partner if it doesn't already fill in for you. The short description. Um, I forget how many characters this is limited to, but it's the short description that appears when people hover their mouse over a product in a catalog. Um, and then the long description. And, um, you know, of course, you can switch this over to HTML if you want to play in HTML. Um, but if I go back to the regular, you can see how this, this works. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and yeah, if you want to insert an image, you just, you know, click on something and then, you know, you, you hit the image insert thing and you can you can do. Uh, I think most of you know how to add an image already, but if you don't, um, you hit browse repositories and then you can just hit upload. You can if it's something you've used really recently, you can hit recent files and you'll probably find it. Otherwise, you can upload a file. If you're using something you found like on, you know, Google image search when you set the you know, Creative Commons thing on to find license, you know, Commons, Creative Commons pictures, you could just use the URL downloader, just copy and, and then paste the URL. And that way you save yourself even having to to download an image file and then re-upload it. It's just a little convenience thing. Um, private files, most of you probably aren't using that yet, but there is a way that under your profile, you can save images into your private file stash, which is useful if there's an image you find yourself using a lot. 
so you don't even have to save it on your local computer and upload it constantly. You can just have it right in ChurchX and then just use the private files whenever you, you need it. OK, um, that's a few notes about images. Um, what else here? Um, the text color, background color works just the same as it does on catalogs. Again, with the meta titles, descriptions and keywords. Those are all um, you can you can take the ones that are taken, you know, just from the the top level stuff, the title of the course or the product, or you can you can write your own if you want to. Uh, here's where that visibility stuff is again with uh, making it available or not available on certain dates, product visibility, product format. Um, OK, so product format, you know, whether this is a live class session, learn, show and pace or hybrid, you don't have to designate. But if you do, it's just one more piece of information that that appears on the product card for it. Um, so price or suggested amount if you or, or payment options should go to. OK, so right now we support these payment options. You can do a a just a, a price, just a straight up, you know, $50 to access this. You can do a pay what you can where you put a suggested amount and people can enter in how much they want to pay for something. Um, or you can do free or you can do a subscription. And by here, I mean monthly subscription. We are going to add a yearly subscription, uh, but this is this is right now a monthly subscription uh, is supported. Um, if somebody um, you know cancels, they can they can cancel on their own their subscription. If they do that, then they have the current period that they paid for for that subscription. And then after that, like a clock starts. And then when that's then then they lose access. If they repurchase, then they get access again to the to the course. That's how our subscription model works. Um, again, you can set the currency. Right now, we we support uh, these currencies. You can set a maximum number of purchases. This is not quite the same as course enrollment, um, and that's important because a product can link to a course, but a product might be other things like multiple courses. So we're limiting it at this level of like how many times can somebody different people click the buy now button on this particular item and you can just set a number for that. Um, and then if it's full or if it's not available yet, this is where you click on the waitlist to activate the waitlist feature. Wait, use waitlist to full. Um, live hours, on your own hours, number of live sessions, number of on your own videos, et cetera. Those are all the things that appear on that right side in that kind of course, that, that product summary box. Those are the items there. By the way, if there's a category that's missing that you can think of that, that I should add, let me know because that's pretty easy to add those kinds of categories. All right, this is uh, a really important section. This is the course enrollment section. Um, the first thing to indicate is whether this is a team based product where one purchase should be shared with multiple people or whether this is uh, just a one and done kind of thing. Um, if it is a team based thing, then we have this option to set the maximum number of team members. You don't you know, if, if you don't know, just put a big number and they'll never reach it. And it's fine. Um, enrollment duration is new uh, right now. We just have the option to set it by a date. So there's a fixed date um, that a person is enrolled until um, we're, we are going to add an option to add a certain number of, of like days. So you could have like somebody buy a purchase, give access to a product for a certain number of days. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the use case for this, but I think it probably will exist in the world. Um, so we have that. Um, these are really cool. The, the group, the group selection and group acquired. Um, so if the course has groups, you can make it available for people to select their group before they do the checkout process. Um, this is especially important where you have a course with live sessions that are only available on certain days, and people want to know if they're available on those days or not before they commit to purchasing the product. OK, Bronwyn. Yeah, uh, so there's going to be a recording of this, Bronwyn, so you can you can catch it later. Um, so. Um, so you can actually uh, select it before. Now you can, if just because a, a a product has courses that have groups, doesn't mean you have to make them select ahead of time. This is an option. So if you click it, then they'll be given those. Um, and if they have multiple courses in a product, then they will get one for each of the courses that they're a part of um, that have groups. So for course number one, here are the possible groups. Course number two, here are the possible groups, and so forth. Um, you have the option of letting them pick just a single group or multiple groups. Um, you also have the option for making it mandatory that they have selected a group or not. And um, this next thing is a request specifically from United in Learning, and I think it's a good one, is ask users for additional information before checkout. So if you do this, they're going to see a question prompt um, when they're checking out, and they can you can put any question you want there. And then you'd be able to retrieve that information later. So if you want to ask them, like if it's an in-person teaching event and you want to ask them if they have dietary preferences, you could do that with this uh, or, or any other kind of use case. 
Um, is answer required? Again, whether or not they have to answer before they're allowed to proceed with checkout. OK, um, the receipt email is one of the really critical uh, pieces in this whole thing. Um, so this is quite custom. It is entirely customizable what these receipt emails look like. So you could put critical information that they need uh, to access a course in here if you want and just know that it's limited to that particular course um, if you want to. Um, it does support embedding images like this one here. Um, it does not really support embedding video. Like you could Im you could put a YouTube link in there, but not really embed a video. And that's part of the limitations of email and just how email works. Um, but anyway, we have that ability. You'll notice that there are these um, things in brackets here. These are what we call short codes. And they are filled in dynamically with the information from that particular course, product, or or uh, client, customer. So customer first name, customer last name, and so forth. If you're not sure which which one it is, on the bottom here, there's this list of all the available product codes for a particular course. So you can help with that. Um, now this is kind of critical. Note for Teams. Um, so the way that team sharing works is that you know one person has purchased a course. All right, and then that person gets this email and the idea is that they would then forward this email to the other people on their team or at least do this team sharing link part here. And then the team sharing link, that link is what people use to sign up who want to join the course by virtue of somebody else's purchase. If that makes sense, this was about the most elegant solution we could come up with for granting additional people access to the same course. Um, we thought about a mechanism where the person purchasing the course would have to put in all the email addresses of the people they want to receive it. But the problem is that people often purchase courses without knowing who on their team wants access, right? Like, um, you know, we, we have we found this with some of our children's ed stuff that like, um, you know, they would sign up for it and then it'd be like, oh, so-and-so is a volunteer. And then, oh, their, their wife want, wants access as well. And so does this other person. Um, so it's easier just to have an email that they can forward or at least a link they can share uh, to create that access. And I can show you how to control that access later, uh, but that's, that's that's the basic thing is just to put in a link there um, and then, you know, additional details for the receipt, like the the date, the price, so forth. Of course, if it's a free price, a free course, you're not going to want to have the price and the transaction ID in there because they'll just be like free or blank. Um, so, yeah, um, customer email address. Yeah, OK, uh, that's fine. Um, so, yeah. So does anyone have any questions about the email receipt and how that works? Okay, uh, it's actually one of those powerful features I think in the whole thing is this ability now to be able to customize your your outgoing receipts. Uh, we are going to add a function to be able to attach. Sorry, you have to put a signature block. No, nope, you don't have to. Uh, well, I mean, I think it's a nice classy thing. So what I'm getting at is that it, your profile doesn't automatically add a signature block to this. No. No, no, this okay. is just all they get is what you see here, right? So what I would recommend is probably if you have a standard receipt you want to use, just copy that code and then just paste, you know, and then and then customize it a little bit on a per course basis if you want. Yeah, um, you can set a CC for the outgoing mail. This is very handy so that when people purchase your course, uh, you get an email a copy of the receipt. So if someone so says later, oh, I can't find it. You know, you can you can see that it came in, and then you can say, did you check your spam folder, and and so on. Um, you can also uh, we not yet, but we're going to add a function to be able to attach attachments to the email too. So if you were if you're doing a course that that had like a workbook or something or like a, a big PDF, you could attach that as an attachment if you wanted to, and then people would get that when they when they sign up. Um, tags. Um, you know, are pretty straightforward. Um, you can add your own tags and they appear with the product and it makes it easy for people to search for things sometimes and find specific things that they might be looking for. You just add them there and they appear in the bottom here. All right. Uh, any any questions about any of that so far, how to edit a product? I guess the only question I have is when you add the ability to add a, an attachment, are you going to put a, a file size limit on that so that people don't accidentally put in a 20 megabyte? Uh, yeah, we're going to have to. You, you, yeah. Good point. I haven't done that yet, but you're right. We'll have to. <laughs> I haven't specified that yet, but but you're right. That's a good idea. Um, but I don't know what that limit will be. I, I need to look online what the kind of the common limits are because 10 is it 10? Because I know that certain email systems have different parameters of what they allow through. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, 
you know, this is the the uh, the managed products page, and you can sort this uh, all these categories here. So, like product name, you can do alphabetical either way. Uh, you know, the short description. I don't know why you'd want to do it by the first letter in the in the short description, but anyway, you could. Uh, we're going to add some filters here so that you can actually filter by a term. So you can just like put in, you know, wisdom and see, you know, all the courses that where wisdom is mentioned in the short description, uh, that kind of thing. But um, that will make it much easier to handle when we've all got like 30 or 40 or 50 courses on here. Um, but yeah, we're working on that. Um, the only other thing I point out when we're when we're looking at a. Um, of uh, a thing here uh, like this course here. Is the product engagement button. Now what this does is it creates the ability to add a user manually to a course. So um, if somebody, for example, has paid you cash to access a course, or let's say they they paid for a course and it was the same price and they can't make it and they want to be transferred to another course, this just makes it really easy to like put somebody into a course. And uh, we're going to add a, a few more fields of information here, but for right now, all you have to do is hit add user manually and then search for them. They they need to be somebody who already has an account, obviously. But you know, if I look up, you know, you know, you know if I look up, you know, John here, like he appears here, I would just click him and then now he would ta -da, he's now in that course. And he's gonna get an email in a second that he joined that course. And if you want to delete somebody off of there, again, you just hit the delete button here and they're removed from that course or, or any courses that are associated with that product. Um what we're going to add to this is this product engagement right here. That's where the um, if if you had a user um, field for people to put in their own data at checkout, this is where that appears. And then this whole table here is going to be exportable as an as an XLS file as a spreadsheet. So um, that's how it's going to work. There's going to be a similar button that's going to be for wait lists that'll give you a list of everybody on the wait list. And again, you can delete people or add people manually or or just dump out the whole list. Um, if you want to send them all an email saying, hey, we've decided to run the course, here's the date, you know, please proceed with purchasing if you want to join us, that, that kind of thing. Um, the only other thing that I forgot to mention, which is really super important, is when you're working on a product, don't forget to add a course to it. <laughs> so if I go to the bottom here to the uh, courses to enroll right here, this is where you indicate what course is is going to create the is going to have the enrollment. And you can do multiple ones and this is a little search box here. So, you know, if I put in like wisdom, you know, then I get, you know, Julius Johnson's wisdom and possibility course. OK, if I put in a different one like, uh, you know. Days, there's a bunch that have the word days in them, right? It just becomes a quick and it's searching both the product code and the product title. So if you just want to do it by product code, you, you can totally do that. So if I just do like edge, like it'll show me all the edge courses. Like that, OK? Um, and you can, as I said, you can click multiple ones. Um, in the future, we are thinking about like other order fulfillment things that might happen. Um, for example, linking to an email uh, list. Like right now, we use a Microsoft uh, automation to do links to um, to uh, email subscription lists like MailChimp. And so if any of you want that, please let me know and I can set that up for you manually. But in the future, you'll be able to manage that yourself and you'll be able to link this to your own uh, MailChimp accounts or or constant contact without me even having to set it up for you. Um, right. OK, all right, so that's how um, the basics work uh, for editing a product, editing a catalog, managing that, uh, doing the uh, uh, things. Are there any questions about what I've shown so far? Uh, just to be clear, so you. Yeah. This is showed you just showed us how to make a, a catalog product and you pointed out don't forget to add a course in later. Are you about to show us how to make our own course? Or is that something we still have to do the course for creation the way we've done it up to this point? Yeah, you still have to create a course and in, in, in Moodle to point to. Yeah. And but and, I'm just saying is, is this something we can do? Because before I've kind of sent my information to you guys and, and then you guys have set it up. Is it now that I can do it myself? You can do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to do it. <laughs> I've been pampering you. <laughs> I don't, want to, I don't want to give you too much work through over there. You know? No, no, no. Do it yourself. You know, yeah, you've got total privileges for that. Uh, okay, pro good. tip, you can also copy an existing course that you already have mm. and use that as a shell and then just, you know, like that's usually what people, as you know, what people usually do in higher uh, in uh, in education on these LMSs is they commonly just have kind of a shell they use as a template and then they just populate it with their own stuff. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay, so we have group selection, the checkout thing. Um, 
let me show you what happens uh, when somebody has signed up for a team thing. Um, OK, so this is the your, your standard dashboard. Uh, one of the things if you haven't already you want to add is the partner sales report. And that is so you turn on editing mode and then you say add a block and then it is sales report. It's not going to appear on here. There it is right there. Sales report. And then um, and you probably want it in the main section, not on the right in the in the tray. Um, but yeah, so the cool thing, um, of course, about this. Oops, ah, sorry, I have too many courses I belong to. OK, the, the neat thing about this is, again, these are sortable, all these categories. So if you want to just look up somebody by their, you know. Uh, email address or something, you know, like, let's see if I can find John in here real quick. Yeah, see John appears here, John Borthwick, right? Uh, and you can then export these lists as either a PDF, Excel or a CSV file. Um, so you can also do all kinds of like date searches, so you can do like all enrollments within the last month. You know, like 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 this. Oops, August. Oh, um, why is that not working? Oh, there you go. Well, anyway, um, yeah. So you can you can do all kinds of date searches and stuff like that, um, and then export out those results. Any questions on how the sales reports work? Okay, yeah. Um, for the team-based stuff, this is another block that you add. This is uh, for admins. So if I turn on block editing, add a block. And then it is Teams administration right here. That's the name of this block. And once you have that, it allows you to control, look at like, OK, so for the creation story, which is one of the Go projects, um, if I click on this, I can see who's used that link to register from that team. So right now it's just me. <laughs> but um, as people fill up those slots, they would appear here. So if you had something where you were only allowing like five people per church team and somebody had to drop out, you could delete somebody and then that link would be available again, like same link. They could just use it again. Um, you can also you can see here that the, the URL for that sharing link just appears right here and uh, you can also copy it. Oops, turn that off. Um, where this little copy icon is that just also copies the link to your to your clipboard. So if you just want to quickly find the sharing link for a team based course, you can just copy that and and and, and share it with people. Um, and you can see here how there's a maximum number allowed and the number of people that have used it so far. Available to. So in this way you can you can manage the teams. You can see who signed up for a team and uh, delete them or whatever. Any questions about the team management stuff? Awesome. OK, um, let's see, did Teams did that? Oh, vouchers. Let's go over vouchers. Um, the voucher system is fairly straightforward. I'm just going to hit the Manage Vouchers button. Um, you, there is a voucher log which shows you um, the use of, of vouchers so far uh, for your courses. And you can also do filters on that. So if you want to look at how many people have used a particular voucher code, like Test95, you can just limit it down to that, and then you can export an Excel spreadsheet from that. So um, in the case of like United and Learning, where they are sponsoring the uh, people from overseas to do a boundary training course, but they need to build that internally to a different department from United and Learning to a different department. Um, this way they can easily generate a list of how many times the voucher code has actually been used. Um, so it's just kind of a handy thing. Um, so to create a voucher, you just hit add voucher. And then you need to give it a unique code. This is the code people are going to put at checkout. Um, so you, you put in a code there. If you want to give it date constraints, you can. You just enable the dates and uh, you know, some sort of text there. You can enable dates or not. Um, you can limit the number of maximum times it could be used. You can then you need to select what category it's going to be in. Um, so like, you know, if I click Junius Johnson here and then it loads, this page then loads what products are available from Junius. And so then you need to click and put a check mark next to whichever one you want to be applicable for, or you could hit select all if this was like a Christmas time discount and is available for any courses. Um, and then you have to give it an amount that's going to be taken off. This can be either a percentage or just a dollar amount. OK, and that's how much is going to be taken off at checkout. Um, OK, so if you put that, if you put a dollar amount, is it going to make that relative to the code to the currency the product is in? It's based on whatever currency the product is set at. Nice. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so you can see we have a bunch of like different checkout codes here, voucher codes. Yeah, and of course you can just quickly delete one if you want to just by hitting the delete voucher button, or you can edit an existing voucher if you want to change the amount the discount is or or the dates that's available from or anything like that. All right. Um, okay, did vouchers did that. Um, one of the other things I just want to point out is we have a pretty nice search feature now. So this catalog search box in the right here. So let me turn off editing mode because there we go. Um, if I if I put anything in here, um, it's but default is to search by relevance. The relevance score is determined by how many times that word appears in the title, the subtitle, the the short description, the long description, and the tags. So if it appears in any of those places, it'll show up in this catalog, and then it's ranked by how many times that word appears. That's our relevance ranking. Um, but you can also rank it by date published, and then that just sorts by when they were put into the catalog. Uh, the newest, I think, being the the first. Okay. Um, what else? Search to that. Sales reports. Um, yeah. Uh, tra oh, transaction history. Yeah, this is kind of cool. So now, when people, they're, if they're wondering if they've purchased something or whatever, if they just go to their profile, they now have this transaction history block that shows them any six, any past purchases. And um, if they hit the receipt button, then it generates a receipt. And this receipt is actually being pulled from Stripe. So it's, it's you know, it has the transaction history and the exact date and time and so forth of the transaction. And they can just print that. They could save it as a PDF if they want to and then or whatever. And they've got their receipts. Um, I'm actually going to change this so it'll show all the free registrations from the catalog as well, because I think that'll be useful. And I want it, and these are actually clickable. So if somebody's trying to find that course and they forgot if they enrolled in it or not, you know, if 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 they can't find it on their dashboard, they could find it through their profile. So I click on this, it'll just take me right to the uh, this this course. You see? Um, yeah. I'm trying to think what else here. All right. So we have about 15 minutes left on our, our hour. I think I've kind of gone through all the functionality. Um, are there any questions about anything here? Or things you'd like to see that aren't there. I guess just one observation, Kay, is that uh, when you're adding blocks into uh, the screen there, that is contextual to the person yes. and their 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 rights within Moodle. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So so regular users could not. Put in a product block or more accurately they could but there would be nothing in it um i, I want to make it so they won't even see the product block at all but right now it'd just be it'd just be empty um but i'll i'll change it so they don't can't even load it um yeah when i'm looking at my dashboard i don't see on the added block the partner sales option you know interesting um, Are you in uh, yes, I'm in edit mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe I can, so I can pull up add blocks and I get you know administration and product catalog comments, but that one's not on the list. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Um, I wonder, like I'm pretty sure I've got you as a manager and all that. Um, just see here, let's suppress list of users. Junius, I'll show you some magic here. Junius, Junius Johnson, log in as. Where's my log in as? I can pretend to be you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dashboard. All right. So, and then edit dashboard and then add block. You were correct. How about that? Yes. Why are you not a manager? All right. I will. By the way, do you like how it noticed the icon here changed? It's got me and it's got like a little <laughs> mini you. That's <laughs> it's really like cool. the Theatikos icon. You know, it's like you are within me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me log back in as myself. Um, OK, that would be under. I can troubleshoot this later if I can't get it right away, but um, let me go to manage courses and categories. But this might be interesting for some of you about how this is done. So Junius Johnson, right? And then. We want to select. Permissions. Assign roles. Manager. No, you are a manager. OK. Sure. OK, I will. I will. I will find out why that's not the case. 
Okay. <laughs> Any other bugs anyone noticed? <laughs> Just a, a question, where do you select the currency that you want to sell a product in? Right. OK, so if I go to catalog and I pick a random. Course here, I'll pick this getting started in stewardship, edit product um, and the where you have the price option, you have the currency options. Let me go down here. So um, this is the price or if it's a pay what you can, it becomes a suggested amount. And um, which auto populates in the field, it's user editable so they can just put in whatever number they want, uh, but this is where you set the currency. So how does it know what the rate is for that? It doesn't. Um, that's handled at the level of your credit card processor. So does this force the credit card to charge in that dollar amount? Like in, in that currency is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, like whatever, whatever. Yeah, and, and so Stripe will charge the credit card in this currency. And then the credit card company gives you the conversion rate that is part of your agreement with the credit card company. Okay, so this is a direct link to the Stripe account. Yes, yes. This this actually, and the integration is so cool with Stripe. Um, like if I if I go to catalogs and like I, I pick one that I haven't already bought. Um, let's spawn here. Okay, so wisdom of possibility geniuses course. Um, so this is where you put in the voucher code. Like if I. You know, it's, it's going to not let me do it see, because that's not the right val code. But anyway, you put in the code and then when you hit um, buy now. It goes over to Stripe and what it's actually doing in Stripe is it checks to see if there already is a product in Stripe product object like this. If not, it creates one. Um, so even within Stripe, I can actually search for courses with. So I have a backup of all the of all the purchase data, not just a backup, but like a detailed backup I can I can very easily dump information from Stripe. Um, so it's it's uploading the picture and everything right to Stripe. Yep. And then once you hit pay, it takes them into the page, like once they've paid directly into the course. It doesn't even wait for a confirmation link to be sent. Um, so, yep. Other questions? Uh, I have a question about unenrolling. Um, if let's yes. say uh, somebody could not make uh, an upcoming um, workshop that they've registered for, how do how does like if if they wanted to unenroll um, and get a refund for the registration fee, how how does that function work? At, at this stage, they still have to let me know <laughs> because oh, okay. I, I have to, I have to get refund. I have mm -hmm. thought about creating a a a function where in the transaction history they can request a refund. Mm -hmm. And that that would trigger some kind of review. Um, right. It's a very similar functionality actually to what I want to create for people having to be approved to join a course mm -hmm. where, you know, somebody could request access and then they have to be approved to join similar kind of functionality. Um, I just haven't haven't specified it yet. OK, so so they would have to let you know then. If they yeah, know. yeah, okay. yeah, gotcha. which happens. I mean, I process a refund request like maybe once every other week or so. Um, it's probably just about as common that somebody says, oh, I can't make that date. Can you just switch me to a different date? And then I just I just do it. And in that case, if you got a request like that where they didn't need to like get a refund, then you could actually do it yourself. You could just go into the manage product thing the and then product, the product yeah. engagements, product, you know, engagements and then and then just add them like that. Add them manually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we need to unregister them from the the one that they didn't make? Probably, uh, yeah. So you yeah. just go to the other one and then just find them on the list and delete Unenroll them. them. Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you. What about the graphic uh, for the catalog? I noticed that you got that layered image. How do, is that something that's auto-generated or when you're in the catalog? Oh, and these ones here? Yeah. Oh, I just made those in Illustrator. So what I'm getting at is that is is the actual image for like in other words that image is that way or that is that is just, created nope. that way that that is exactly what that image looks like there's no trickery or css going on that's just that's okay. just the image yeah it's important when you make these images by the way to, to use a um to use png as your file format not jpeg because png supports transparent backgrounds so you know this is actually transparency 
There was some discussion about whether we were going to keep using those, though, those layered yes, ones. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was saying that the um, um, the United Learning, United Church um, graphics people are considering it because I just did not have the right. bandwidth to answer that design question. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, if anybody yeah. has a better solution, I'm happy to, to hear it. But what's tricky is it needs to appear different visually from the regular, you know, product listings, I think. Like, it needs to look different. Um, but in what way different? I'm open to suggestions. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. 